But by experience, I was kind of talking about for a while, perhaps this should have been the first slide, but you know, I like to hold people in suspense a little bit if you don't know what it's about. Um, an expert by experience is someone who has lived experience of using and or caring for someone who has used health and or adult social care services. So a lot of people think, oh, you know, you're an expert by experience, you, you've been in a, a mental health hospital. Not necessarily. It could mean that you are a carer. Um, further to that, a lot of people think it's just for mental health services, where actually it's a variety of different services. So adult social care, um, you know, GP services, acute services, um, a, a lot of different organisations, including regulatory and research organisations, incorporate experts by experience in a lot of different domains. And we're not only talking nationally here, we're talking um, internationally. So even Australia, for example, inc incorporates experts by experience on a kind of, um, you know, a, a legal level. So, so it's, it's, it's very broad and diverse. Co-production is a word that's kind of thrown around a lot these days. It's kind of um, the, the buzzword um, and it can be quite a subject, subjective term. You know, um, as I say, there's quite a few different levels to it. Um, I guess it's the kind of same as participation or involvement, but there's the fundamental difference of equality in the decision making process. So, for example, if you, if you guys are coming up with something as a service or as an MDT or a ward or whatever, I mean, you you take the idea to your service users and you say, well, what do you think of this? You know, that could be deemed as service user involvement, if you like. Whereas actually, if you're starting from the point of co-producing something together, that is what co-production is, if you like, because you're, it's, it's the, the, the starting point of doing things together collaboratively and then moving forward. Um, co-production, not only that, but it's also about kind of co-delivery. So not only coming up with the idea together, but actually executing it together. You know, th this is kind of common sense stuff. You know, you guys are a smart bunch. When you have people involved in creating something, they're more likely to engage with it. I know it's difficult for some of us to comprehend considering psychi psychiatry was kind of based or its roots on coercion and stuff like that. But, um, you know, th th this is kind of um, a, a, a really important turn that we're having. Um, you know, something's happening in today's day and age and there's, there's a power shift happening and um, fundamentally we're talking about sharing of power um, we're talking about different perspectives leading to different outcomes and increased engagement this leads on to another thing called peer support so you know there, there's lots of different things happening here as you can see you've got experts by experience which can be involved in lots of different things you've got this co-production thing and then you've got peer support now, peer support, I, I, there's lots of different kind of, um, you know, definitions for it. I, I like this one from the US, from the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, which defines peer support as, quote, services that are delivered by individuals who have common life experiences with the people they are serving, and that they have a unique capacity to help each other based on shared affiliation and a deep understanding of particular experiences. So looking at a, a little bit of the research just around peer support workers, because I, I thought you guys would be interested on this. I, I don't um, you know, quote research a lot, but considering I just started the masters this week and I'm speaking to doctors, I thought I'd give it a shot. So apparently peer support workers tend to produce specific improvements in patients' feeling of empowerment. When patients are in frequent contact with peer support workers, their stability in employment, education and training has been shown to increase. The introduction of peer support workers has been associated with a reduction of alcohol and drug use amongst patients with co-occurring substance abuse problems. Patients receiving peer support have shown improvements in community integration and social functioning. Most commonly, the inclusion of peers in the workforce produces the same or better results in a range of outcomes when compared with services without peer staff. If we have any um, quite senior members of staff in the room, I think you'll like this one. The financial benefits of employing peer support workers do indeed exceed the costs, in some cases by a substantial margin. What I'd like to kind of do now is touch upon my role within Signet Healthcare, which is you know, my, my, my main day job. I'm sure a lot of you guys have heard of Signet. Um, it's a very large independent mental health provider. Um, and th there is the potential that's about to be a, a lot larger in the coming months, rumour has it. 
My role within Cigna is that I work directly alongside the Director of Nursing to shape and improve service user involvement and co-production on both a local and strategic level. So it's, you know, that kind of sitting on board meetings and, and all of that stuff, but um, I'm, I'm not the token that um, you, you, would, you would think of. You know, I, I don't go to these meetings and just sit quietly in the corner. I am very challenging and um, I, I, at times I do have to be reeled in a little bit. Um, I've got quite uh, outspoken and um, I, I, I think um, you know, they, they like that and, 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 and that's what they want. If we're going to have people to just come and sit down and not do anything, you know, that, that, that's kind of the, the definition of tokenism, isn't it? We've got a lot of stuff in terms of recovery colleges and reducing restricted practices. That's something I'm very passionate about and something um, which, which we'll kind of touch upon in a moment. So this is just one example um, of you know, my attempt to kind of hit two birds with one stone. Um, going around to the hospitals when I first started, I, it was last year, it was, it was, I think it was around this time, people told me that towards the end of the year they'll feel quite depressed when they're in hospital because Christmas would be coming up and you know some people on the ward will get Christmas cards, they might not, some people will get presents, they might not. And at the same time we were doing a big drive on reducing restricted practice. And you know, when we're talking about reducing restricted practice, I'm not talking about just seclusion, I'm not talking about um, restraint, I'm not talking about um, you know, rapid trank, I'm not talking about that stuff. That stuff is all very important and we're all, we're all very aware of it. But sometimes when we're focusing on that a lot, we can forget about some of the more human things such as blanket restrictions, which is blanket rules, which is something I have a particular kind of interest in. Um, so at the time we're doing a big drive around least restrictive practice and reducing blanket rules. So um, I had an idea to basically approach Hallmark and you know, I, I said to them, you know, I work for this organisation, you know, some people are in hospital, we've got a thousand people in hospital and it would be good for everyone to get a Christmas card this Christmas. So a few days later they, they sent you know, a thousand Christmas cards to my, to my house. They were quite the expensive ones as well, they were the, like the £10 ones. So it was quite um, it was quite substantial but then I, I got the board and quite senior members within Signet Health to actually hand write every single one of those cards and I told them they could only have a drink on the hour can only go to the toilet on the hour can only do this and that on the hour and you know so, you know this is serious some people are saying you know Raph I need to use the I need I need to use the toilet I need I need a drink and um, you know w what's your rationale and um, these are the exact questions that sometimes we have as service users when we're on a ward, when we're not being treated as individuals and being treated as a collective, because everybody should be treated as individuals and that, that was the kind of point. There was a, another kind of uh, hidden element that was something I was trying to push, which we've kind of resolved now, of when one first goes to hospital, you know, you haven't got your benefits sorted out, you haven't got any money, and then you might have leave immediately, but what do you do? Um, you, you, you haven't got a freedom pass or whatever in, in, in some cases. So towards the end, um, we got our director of nursing to take a long walk to the post office with the thousand Christmas cards, just to kind of let it sink in on how it may feel on your first day to hospital. The People's Council is something that I developed within Signet to, to really feed in to the sharing best practice, to lessons learned, ensuring people are heard at every level of the organization. We've got 23 hospitals, 74 wards, two being um, uh, care homes and the others being mental health hospitals. Um, the, the, the purpose of the People's Council, it's a little bit like the Patient Council or Service User Forum that you guys hear of, but it's, it's with a twist. And um, the purpose of it is to gather feedback from the ward to the board ensure people who use signet services and their carers are, are heard at all levels of the organization <coughs> work with and influence the executive management board share best practice across hospitals co-produce policies and procedures and so on the structure that we have is one <coughs> overall signet people's council which i'll get to in a moment and we have a regional one in the north and south and then we have kind of hospital level one so each hospital also has a Can people's I council we couldn't. Oh, I see. I'm so sorry. Because it's I'm finding yeah. difficult readings. Okay. Uh, what, what, what I can do, I'll, I'll send a copy out as well no, after. Thank you. No, don't worry. I just thought if that came down, it would be clear. Yeah. Can't come down. Don't hurt yourself. 
Um, so we, we have people's councils at hospital levels and um, that kind of feeds back to some of the stuff that's happening on a ward level. So on a ward level, you have your kind of community meetings and stuff like that. And we want all of that to feed into the hospital levels, people's council, which, which, which kind of ripples up. We had our launch for the people's council, which is the overall one. So the one that covers all the hospitals and um, the, 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 the principle behind it is not just getting service users in a room to talk about whatever they want to talk about, but to actually incorporate lots of different bodies. So CPC, service users, family carers, charities, you know, um, in, 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 in the bottom right, you see the, the, the chief executive of the Challenging Behaviour Foundation, Vivian Cooper, OBE. On the picture next to that on the left, you have a current service user in one of our services. Next to him, you have a former service user of one of our services. Next to him, you have a ward manager. Then if you see in the back, you have our recovery colleges lead. Then next to him, if your eyesight's quite good, um, you'll see an external expert by experience. Um, then on the picture on the left with me and, 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 and the lady wearing glasses, uh, she's head of hospital inspections for CQC in the London region. And the one with the lady hugging me and looking at me in a rather bizarre way is a, is, is a good friend of mine. She's also an expert by experience, but she's a carer of two young people with um, autism. And above, you know, we had our director of nursing and stuff. The point of this is that, you know, we've got a lot of different people, different perspectives in the room, all sitting around the table together and meeting halfway on a lot of things. We all share different views. We've all got different outlooks on things. but. Um, by having different perspectives, sometimes we can challenge each other's thinking and um, come to a, a general consensus. How does this kind of work on a day-to-day? On, on -day? You know, I'm not only going around hospitals, handing chocolates out and delivering Christmas cards. I also do do reports, um, but you know, my reports are, are quite simple. I'm not medically qualified, so I don't like judging people when they tell me things which I may think are a delusion and I learned that in my early days when I first started speaking to people and someone told me that they were a billionaire and I actually thought you know that this guy's completely he's delusional and you know, after I was speaking to the staff in the office shortly after he indeed was a billionaire <laughs> so um, from that day on I vowed never to judge someone again and and, and um, you know take people's word for, for on a word for word basis and ensure that people are heard. So I basically go to all of our, all of, all of our hospitals. Um, I produce a, quite a lengthy report. So, you know, some of them can be 30, 50 pages long. And um, I basically speak to every service user within the hospital and I, I ensure that it's, their, it's a quote. So it's their direct quote. How does the chief operating officer in head office in London hear directly from a service user on a ward on the other side of the country, or one of our sites in Bury or something, for example, and that's through these reports. The problem with you know, NHS trusts or big independent sector organisations is that you have so many different layers, and by the time the feedback gets from the ward to the board, it's been changed, it's been edited, you know, you've got, oh, the person meant this, and then you change a word. By the time it gets to that person, it's, it, it, it's been diluted so much that it, it doesn't really have much of an impact. These are shared with other hospitals. They're shared with, um, you know, we share them with the CQC, we share them with Health Watch. Um, it, it, it really demonstrates our openness and transparency and, and also about the lessons learned. You know, it's, I've, I believe that it's unacceptable that if you have something happening on one of your wards, that the same thing happens on another one of your wards. It's inexcusable. And the same way if something happens in one of our hospitals, it's unacceptable for it to happen again in another one. And then they're saying, oh, you know, we didn't know anything about it, lessons learned. Well, you had this the other day. You might not be the same hospital, you might not have the same hospital manager, but you have the same operational director. You have the same people coming to your hospital to do your PMBA training, for example, that does the PMBA training at the other hospital. Why isn't that information being communicated? Um, and, and that's one of the things that these reports do. So um, some of the things that the, the CQC kind of say about this, um, th th this is my role in particular. So expert by experience lead, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just mention one. So Signet Hospitals had recently appointed an expert by experience lead to facilitate user involvement across the organizations. P 
patients were familiar with the expert by experience and the expert by experience lead had supported patients to raise a number of concerns with, with the managers. So these kind of things were in, or they were the only things in the section on the reports. These were reports on three different hospitals as an area of outstanding practice. How this kind of reflects in the end when we're talking about outcomes and when we're talking about peer support and co-production and all these things. Ben's a good example because Ben was in um, one of our hospitals. He was, he, he was in for quite a while and um, you know, he was a, a, a secure service user. Um, when you're in hospital for a while, particularly forensic services, coming back out into the community can be quite a, a, a daunting thing, probably you know, not, not only for um, the, the, the person, but, but for all the stakeholders involved as well. Within two weeks of Ben's discharge, I was able to secure him an expert by experience role at one of our hospitals. And you know, in the picture, you can see him bumping into um, lots of, of, of people that you know, he kind of knew. So in the picture on the top right, that's one of his former ward managers and picture in the top left that's you know support worker or someone he knew from the ward and um, Ben really helped us kind of start challenging our thinking about what it's like being discharged how we can further support people having these kind of perspectives unless you've actually been through them yourself is really difficult to, to, to be able to to, to, to to speak about so um, this is the last slide, quite controversial one, which I'm going to challenge you guys a little bit on. You know, co-production, experts by experience, peer support, you know, sometimes we hear these things and we think, oh, you know, it's another good initiative that will die out soon or something like that. Now, I, I can assure you guys that, that these things are here to stay. I remember, uh, I forgot his name, but I'll, I'll quote him anyway, I'll be able to reference it later. But you know, in the late 1800s, um, the head of a hospital in, in France, I believe, is it Jean Baptiste or, or something, um, said that, you know, in essence, the future of psychiatry and, 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 and mental health is best run by service users because they're able to understand people more. This is just kind of basic thinking. I mean, psychiatry doesn't have to all be about coercion, medication, restrictive practice and risk assessments. If it was all about that, you know, I certainly wouldn't have um, met my recovery. You know, I, I was in a, a very bad place. I've been secluded a lot of times. I spent a lot of years in hospital. Um, but I'm coming from a place where my, my psychiatrist didn't even want to tell me what his favorite color was. You know, you won't, you won't tell me what your favorite color is, but you want, to, you want me to tell you my deepest, darkest secrets. You know, I, I believe that these kind of relationships have to be a little bit reciprocal. In, in those pictures there, at the, in the top one, he's the, his name is Theo Bello, and he's, he's now clinical director, I believe, at Barnet Enfield and Harringay Mental Health Trust. But at the time when I was a service user, he was the senior nursing manager. Um, and, you know, the reason why I put that picture in there is just to, to, to show you sometimes how things can change. I remember, you know, Theo used to come and do like reviews and stuff for me when I was in seclusion. That picture was taken in his back garden when he invited me over for a barbecue. And um, the, the, the gentleman next to him is a hospital manager at one of our services who's now a close colleague of mine. And um, the, the lady below is um, the, 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 my line manager, the director of nursing. And uh, I never thought that she would have had chickens in her back garden until I went over to her place because I really like KFC. And um, you know, it's those kind of things that really break down those barriers and, and make me be able to open up more. And, and whether it's in a working environment or whether it's as a service user, I'm not saying invite service users over to your house and stuff like that. But I, I, I put at the bottom that, you know, the majority of service users don't want to find out where you live and have a tea party in your back garden. Um, you know, w of course, there's those kind of professional barriers. but. As I, as, it, as I state here, sometimes we get so caught up in the process that we miss the context and professional barriers can be barriers to people's recovery as well. Um, I, I, I guess ultimately what, what this all comes down to is there's lots of ways you guys can materialise this on the ward. Um, some of the things I'll say, you'll say, oh, we already do that, but it's not around, about doing it, it's about doing it properly. Okay. Um, is it a tick, tick box exercise or are we doing it for real? So for example, 
ward representatives. A lot of services have ward representatives. Um, you know, I meet with my ward reps once a week. They all have my phone number. They all have my email address. If there's a problem, they'll call me. If it's a serious problem, I can call someone at head office. If it's a serious problem, I can turn up at midnight unannounced. Um, it's a paid role. They get provided with a reference before they leave. Um, it's a you know it's contract contractual stuff like that. Service users having roles. Um, we're even moving towards a point where experts by experience are going to start taking part in MDT meetings, being involved in discharge planning. Um, you know it's, it's easy for us to kind of when we're talking about discharge, for example, to say oh you know you're going to do this, you're going to do that. You know, it's a bit, it's a little, it's a little bit annoying for me working in the independent sector because once people are discharged from our services, our responsibility stops. Within the NHS, you guys have a great opportunity to be able to follow people out into the community, which I believe was the kind of old way of doing things. I'm sure a lot of you guys will remember that I was only a baby, but so I hear. Um, I believe that kind of peer support of the community can definitely reduce links of stay, that's what the research says, can definitely support in avoiding readmissions and also probably make your jobs a little bit easier as well. Um, the changes that we've seen when implementing co-production, expert by experience, services involvement structures, you know, we've seen a, a reduction in, in incidents, we've seen a reduction in restraint, we've seen a reduction in staff sickness. The, the benefits are absolutely amazing and I would, I would definitely um, suggest that, that that's taken into consideration and um, you, know, you, you guys can do a lot more. Everyone can do a lot more. Um, what I'll do, I'll, when I send a slide out, I'll send you like a, a long list of the stuff that, that I'm kind of involved in in various organisations to give you an example of what you guys perhaps can support on a ward level you know, board representative was just one example, but we're talking about service user feedback reports. We're talking about service users going to different wards just for the day, stuff like that. Little things which you think at first, well, what's the benefit in that? But actually, you've got things happening on one ward, but you've got the solution on another. And by sharing the staff and service users together and those different perspectives, it can make a big change to your services.